Python Beats. In this video, we're going to look at some applications, specifically the application of applying the derivative concept to position functions and all the other details that accompany that situation. Let's go. All right. So we just start with the situation in which we are assuming that we have a position function. Let's call the position function S of T here. So S is going to give the position of an object moving along a straight line at time T. So position, of course, has units that are either like feet, meters, some type of measurement of length. And it's telling us relative to some starting location where this object is at time t. So that's the function that we're going to begin with here. Now, some of these things will be just as reminders, but some of it's going to be new as well. Notice that the displacement here, displacement, this word, of this object, say from t is equal to a to t is equal to a plus delta t is going to be just the change in position over this time interval. And so we can denote that by delta s, if you will, change in position, which is s of a plus delta t minus s of a. So we're just trying to think, okay, wherever this object is here, right, at t is equal to a, it's somewhere. And then I just move out from there, delta t units, and I'm at some other location, a plus delta t. Now, over this interval, right, the object has done something. Maybe it's gone up and down. Maybe it's gone left and right. And all we're saying here is, if you take the differences between the two outputs, s of a plus delta t, and subtract from that s of a, then we call that the displacement, and really all it's telling us is how and where, how far and where is this object relative to the starting position of t is equal to a. So really, like I said, the displacement is just telling us how far the object is from its posi position at t is equal to a after delta t amount of time has passed. This does not give us the distance that the particle has traveled as we're going to see um, as we go through these examples. It just tells us how far away it is from its original location at t equals a and also in which direction. Now, something we've already really seen, but it's relevant to this discussion, is that the average velocity of the object over this same interval here, a to a plus delta t. Average velocity, as we've seen, is just an average rate of change in the context in which we have a position function. So all that's going to be is like we've seen in a previous video, the change in the position, delta s, over the change in the amount of time, delta t, which of course is just s of a plus delta t minus s of a over delta t. So that's just the, the displacement over this interval over the amount of time that has passed. This gives us the average velocity and of course, depending on the sign in the numerator, this may be positive or negative, and that tells us something. And now that we've talked a lot about derivatives up to this point, we can now also say what the instantaneous velocity of the object is at t is equal to a. So of course, that is our derivative function of s, s prime of a, here, and by definition, you're just taking the average velocity, as we see right here in this quotient, and letting the delta t go to zero. That is, of course, the slope of the tangent line at t is equal to a on the graph of s. The instantaneous rate of change, but in this context, it is the instantaneous velocity. If we wanted to denote it this way over here, using Leibniz notation, we would write ds dt evaluated at t is equal to a, right? So it all means the same thing. And now we can also write v of a as the velocity is, of course, the rate of change of the position. So v of a, if you will, for velocity at a. 
And in general, if we wanted to just find a velocity function for any value of t for which this is defined, then we just take the derivative function of s, s prime of t down here. But we'll call it v of t if we'd like the velocity function at that same instant t, which of course is the same as ds dt. So it's just the instantaneous velocity of the object at time t, the derivative of s at t. So a lot of what we said so far is kind of like a refresher, but believe me when I say there's new stuff here. Speed, how about speed, okay? The speed of the object at time t is defined to be the magnitude of the velocity at time t because you think, well, a velocity function, which is measuring the slope of the tangent line at t on the graph of s, those slopes could be positive or negative. And in context, that means that the object, of course, may be moving upwards or downwards or in the negative or positive directions in general. And so velocity has direction attached to it, right? Hence the plus or minus, depending on what the situation is. However, when we talk about speed, speed is what we call a scalar, and it does not associate a direction with it. So if you say you're going, say, 60 miles per hour, that embeds no information about which direction you're going. So if I take the magnitude of the velocity function at t, then that is what gives us speed here. How about acceleration? This is something that is a little bit um, of a new idea in terms of our conversation. The acceleration at time t is defined to be the rate of change of the velocity. So how is the velocity changing? And so what we'll do is we'll denote that by say a of t for acceleration function at time t. But since we're defining it to be the rate of change of the velocity, then of course that's the same thing as taking v prime of t here. Or equivalently, s double prime of t, right? Since v is the derivative of s, and if I differentiate that, I'm really the same as differentiating s twice. So we could write that also as dv dt, or the second derivative of s with respect to t. So how is the velocity changing? That's what acceleration means. And notice that this acceleration function is going to have units of position over time squared. So that's because velocity has units position over time. And if I differentiate that with respect to time, t that is here, then I will have the unit of time squared appearing in my denominator here for the units. So the units are of course important. So we'll use this acceleration as we're gonna see in some other things. Now let's talk a little bit about when position is increasing or decreasing based on the tools that we have set up so far in this video. And to do that, I wanna pull up a little figure here that I made. And so what we see in this picture here is two graphs, okay? The graph on the left, let's just say that that is the function, the position function s of t here. Now remember, when we're talking about the position function s of t, it's always in relationship to an object or a particle or whatever it might be moving along a straight line. So over here on the right, this is the particle's path along the line. And let's just think of the positive direction on this line as to the right and the negative direction to the left. Now keep an eye here, my particle or object, let's watch its path along the line as I move through the position function at the same time. So notice we're starting at t is zero here. And at that instant, this thing has some initial position. And so as I move, you can see the particle moving to the left, back to the right, and so on. 
And so if I go all the way down here to the left, right, just right there is where I'm starting it. We can see that on this interval up to this hump right here, this local extreme point, the position is increasing, right? And so if I'm moving in that direction, my particle or object on the right is moving in the positive direction as it should be because the position is increasing. And then once I get to that local extreme point there on this next interval from this local max to this local min, my position should be decreasing, right? And so that's what's happening. Look at the line. The object is moving to the left. Its position is decreasing. And then eventually I get to this local min and notice our position is going to increase again. So my object is going to start moving back into the positive direction. And so really what this is supposed to help us understand is that if the position is increasing, then of course the object is moving in the positive direction along its linear path. If the position is decreasing, then the object is moving in the negative direction along its linear path. But when we say the position is increasing or decreasing, that's also equivalent to saying that its tangent line is going to have a positive slope. And thus, really, it's all about its derivative here. The derivative of position is velocity. And thus, if the velocity is positive, our object should be moving in the positive direction. And if our velocity is negative, the object should be moving in the negative direction. So when is position increasing, decreasing? Well, increasing when the velocity is positive, when its instantaneous rate of change of the position is positive, and it will be decreasing in position if the velocity is negative for the reasons that we just talked about. Now there's this other location when the object is at rest, and that's really when the velocity is equal to zero. So if the velocity is zero, my slope of my tangent line on the position function will be horizontal, right? And that's really a location for which the object is not moving. Could be for just a split instant in time. It could be it's changing position there. We don't know. All we know is at that location, it's at rest at least momentarily. And depending on the nature of the position function, it may or may not change signs, as we'll see. All right, so we're gonna do examples eventually of this here in a bit. But one more thing to think about is, when is the object speeding up and slowing down? Now, if you go back to this diagram that we are just looking at, and we go like say right here at this point. So it's almost at a rest stop, right? Now, as I move to the right, you can kind of see something happen there. As we're near this local min, the slopes are gonna be positive as we move to the right from the local min point. Now, if I drew some tangent lines here, we can see that indeed the tangent lines will have slopes that are positive, but as I move farther to the right, those slopes get more and more bigger, right? The function is getting more steeper. So if we kind of look at the particle on the right here, we can see that it seems like as I move to the right, it speeds up. It goes to the right faster. And in fact, I have this other diagram to help us really understand why that's true. So let me pull up a different diagram here. Now in this diagram, we can see uh, a graph, the blue graph here of a function, let's just say that that's our position function and, um, or really any function, but you can see it's concave down, right? Concave down, downwards opening parabola. Now let's look at the slopes. Remember, if I am measuring how slope is changing, that's the same thing as looking at the second derivative because it's the slopes of the slopes. Now, this slope where we're at initially, clearly positive, right? And it has its corresponding numerical value, some positive number. And as I move to the right, those slopes are still positive, as we can see. However, 
the slopes are getting smaller. They're decreasing, right? You can see the numerical value of the slope is getting smaller because the steepness of the tangent line is getting less and less. And eventually I get to this point where the slope is zero somewhere at the top, right? Now think of what's going on there. Moreover, because the slopes are positive, along that interval, way down there up to this location here, the slopes are positive, which means the velocity would be positive if this is a position function. And moreover, the slopes are decreasing. So if the slope is decreasing, then my acceleration should be negative because the velocity is decreasing. And we would interpret that as a slowing down situation because even though my position is increasing, my velocity is decreasing and eventually my velocity gets to a zero up there. Now, if I go down this concave down path now on the right where it is a decreasing function for the position, of course, it's decreasing, so the slopes are going to be negative, meaning the velocity will be negative. And as I continue on in that direction, the velocity gets more and more negative. And so in that situation on this graph, the speed of the object is actually increasing as I move in the negative direction. So in that case, we should be thinking of the object as speeding up because, well, its slopes are getting bigger, but just in the negative direction. They're getting bigger in magnitude. And in that case, the velocity is both negative and the acceleration is negative. They have the same signs. So we can see on the left here, right, it was slowing down and on the right, it was speeding up. Now let's look at one more diagram kind of the flip side of this, here's a concave up graph. And so similarly, from way down here, at least where I'm starting, as I move to the local min point here, my velocity is gonna be negative since the function is decreasing. All right, so I'm moving along, we can see we're negative, but what's happening to the slopes? Remember, we're measuring how the slopes are changing. Far to the left, we're pretty steep in the negative direction. And as I move closer and closer to the local extreme point here, we can see that the steepness of our tangent lines is decreasing, right? It's getting smaller in steepness, but yet it's still negative. So in this case, the velocity is going to be decreasing in magnitude until we get to this location of the local min. And after that, we're positive velocity again. And as I continue on, my, my slopes get bigger and bigger, right? My velocity is increasing over there. But moreover, the velocity is positive and the acceleration is positive since the velocity is increasing. And so you can think of this right-hand side of this parabola as a situation in which the object is moving in the positive direction and it's speeding up. Whereas on to the left of the local min here, this way, I'm going pretty fast over there because of my slope in the negative direction, but then my acceleration is slowing down, right? So those are really the four different situations that we are talking about here. And that is why we write these statements here is that the object is going to be speeding up if the velocity and acceleration have the same signs. So they're either both positive or both negative, as we saw in the diagrams a moment ago. Depending on which direction the object is moving, then if the acceleration sign is the same as the velocity sign, then I will be speeding up in that same direction. So what do those two situations look like? It was the right-hand side of the parabola like so. So that's really a concave down and decreasing situation. Or it's the right-hand side of the concave up parabola where we can see in the picture on the left 
V is negative, and A is also negative, as we showed in those dynamic figures a moment ago. And on the one on the right here, the velocity is positive, and the acceleration is also positive. So these are the two cases in which the object is speeding up. Whereas it is slowing down if the velocity and acceleration functions have opposite signs. So we saw that in the diagrams a moment ago as well. And so what are those two situations? Well, I can be concave down and increasing. In this case, the velocity is going to be positive, right? Because it's an increasing function, but the acceleration will be negative. And the only other situation that we looked at was the situation like so, in which we had a concave up graph, but decreasing function. In this case, the velocity would be negative since the function is decreasing and the acceleration would be positive because it is increasing in size numerically as we move left to right, right? So very negative here, less negative here. So if I'm going from really negative to less negative, then that indicates the velocity is going to be increasing there. So keep all those in mind because we're about to do a problem showing a whole variety of these things we just talked about. All right, so here's the problem. And this example will conclude our video, but there is a bunch of different parts here. We have a particle moving along a straight line. And let's say according to some made up law of motion right here, S of T is one third t cubed minus five halves t squared plus four t. And let's say that's for non-negative t value. So we just start at t is zero. And here t is measured in seconds and s is measured in meters just for the sake of our situation. Based on that, we're gonna ask some questions, find some things. First thing we wanna do is find the velocity and acceleration functions for this particle and also state their units because we'll use these two functions to do other things. So let's do that. All right, well, velocity function here is just going to be the derivative of the position. So we have a polynomial, power rule, power rule, power rule. So what do we get? We get a t squared minus a 5t plus a 4. And of course, that's just found by differentiating term by term and using the power rule. So there's our velocity function and what are the units? Well, the units will be units of position over units of time. So in this case, that would be in meters per second here since that's the meters, that's the unit stated in the problem. The acceleration function, which is the derivative of the velocity function or the same thing as the second derivative of the position function, well, just differentiate the velocity function we just found a moment ago above. Another power rule with a polynomial that quadratic gives us 2t minus 5. And remember, the units for acceleration are position over time squared. In this case, that would be meters per square second. So there's our velocity and acceleration functions. And we're going to use those two functions to do other things in the same problem. Like in part B, when is the particle at rest? Well, remember the particle is going to be at rest if its velocity is equal to zero. So all we're gonna do is set the velocity function here equal to zero. So from above, that is a t squared minus five t plus four. And notice that this quadratic, set it up this way on purpose, is nice and factorable. It factors the t minus four times t minus one. And thus, when t is equal to 4 and t is equal to 1, and of course, these are in units of seconds. So that's when the particle is just chilling, just for a very, very quick, brief moment. Now, when is the particle moving in the positive direction? Remember, that means our velocity should be positive since the position will be increasing. So what I like to do when figuring this out is, of course, we're, we're solving a nonlinear inequality, right? We're solving when is that quadratic positive? You could graph it, 
but it's also nice to have a little sign chart here because we'll, we'll also use the same sign chart to talk about uh, speeding up, slowing down in a moment. And think of sign chart where I have these values of t, one and four is where the velocity is going to be zero, right? So I make my little sign chart here, <clears throat> excuse me. And then I'll just do sign analysis. I'll perform the sign analysis as we've seen in other videos. So for instance, if I pick a number between one and four, let's say I pick three and I plug it into my velocity, I am going to get a negative velocity in that interval, keeping in mind the intermediate value theorem. It can't change signs other than at these locations. If T is like bigger than four, say a billion, well, gigantic large number times gigantic large number, it's gonna be positive. And then to the left of one, just say plug in zero or so, it's also positive. So as we can see in the sign chart, the particle is moving in the positive direction when the velocity is positive, so what, when's that going to be? Well, for the time interval here. Now remember, we're assuming t is bigger than or equal to zero for this situation, right? So we can only start at zero. So starting at zero up to one and union that from four to infinity. There we go. Right, that's where the velocity is positive. Again, t is bigger than or equal to zero here for this situation. How about when the particle is speeding up? So here's where I wanna use uh, my acceleration and velocity together. Now remember, this is gonna happen when V of T, the velocity, and A of T, the acceleration, have the same signs, right? We concluded that earlier in this video. So I also have to perform a sign analysis on my acceleration function. Now, just to refresh our memory, remember the acceleration function right up there is 2t minus five. So we're gonna have to first figure out when the acceleration a of t equal to 2t minus five is zero because that is a location for which uh, the acceleration possibly could change signs. Of course, that's gonna happen if t is equal to five halves or if you prefer 2.5. So I see my velocity sign chart above, and what I'm gonna do is just redraw it right down here, and you'll see why in a moment, it's just be easier to visualize. So here's one, here's four, these are Vs, these are Ts, zero at one and four, positive to the left of one, negative between one and four, and positive to the right of four. All right now what I'm gonna do is now stack right below that my acceleration sign chart. So here is now values of acceleration in time values t. The location of 2.5 or 5 halves for t, which about right there, say 5 halves, we know the acceleration is zero. And now I'll do my sign chart for a, because I need the signs of the acceleration. Notice if I pick, say, negative 5 trillion, the acceleration is negative. And if I pick positive five trillion, the acceleration is positive. So it's a big thing to remember. Sometimes uh, people get confused. Just because acceleration is positive or negative has nothing to do with speeding up or slowing down. It's always in conjunction with the signs of the velocity at the same time. So in this case, I need to figure out when V and A have the same signs and what I like to do is just kind of draw a little picture here to visualize. Notice that between one and five halves, the velocity and acceleration are both negative. And then also from four to infinity, the velocity and acceleration are both positive. So we're talking about this stuff here, and of course this stuff here. In the other intervals, we can see the velocity and accelerations have opposite signs, which would indicate it's slowing down. So in the end, what's our conclusion? Well, it's gonna be speeding up. If T belongs to the interval one to five halves, also on the interval four to infinity. So we figured it out. Nice. 
All right, a couple more parts of this problem before we wrap it up. What is the total distance that the particle travels in the first five seconds? Now, this is also important to understand that the particle is doing what it's doing, right? It's going up or down, left or right, depending on the certain intervals. Distance is not the same as displacement because the object, or in this case, the particle, can change directions over a period of time. That would not give us the total distance if we calculated displacement because it wouldn't account for the changes of back and forth that it's moving. If I run five feet to the left and then I run five feet right back to the right, clearly I went 10 feet, but my starting position is the same as my ending position. See what I mean? So really here we have to remember our sign chart of the velocity above in that the particle is moving in the positive direction from zero to one. It's moving in the negative direction from one to four. And then it's moving in the positive direction again from four to infinity. So if I want to find the total distance traveled by this particle in the first five seconds, then what I'm going to have to do is take the magnitude of the displacement over each one of these uh, corresponding intervals in which it's moving in the different directions. So that is, I want to know what the magnitude is of s of 1 minus s of 0, right? So in that interval, the particle is moving to the right based on the velocity sign chart. And if I take the magnitude of that, I'll get a positive number, which gives me the distance traveled from 0 seconds to 1 second. Plus, all right, the next interval is from 1 to 4. The particle is moving in the negative direction. So I'm going to have to take s of 4 minus s of 1 and take the magnitude of that. That'll give me how much distance was traveled in the negative direction. And finally, we're ending at 5 seconds. So, whoops, remember from 4 to infinity, the velocity is positive. So I'll take s of 5 minus s of 4 and take the magnitude of that. And that'll give me the last little piece of distance I need to add up to get the total distance. Now remember our position function was a one-third t cubed minus five halves t squared plus four t. So to avoid all the messy arithmetic here, and you can just go ahead and verify this on your own on a calculator or something, I've went ahead and pre-calculated these so we don't take 20 minutes doing arithmetic. S of zero was zero and it ends up s of 1 is 11 6. So in this first part, s of 1 minus s of 0, that's 11 6 minus 0. Take the magnitude of that. Plus, s of 4 ends up being negative 8 thirds is where this particle is located. And then, of course, s of 1 we just found was 11 6. So magnitude of negative 8 thirds minus 11 6. Um, and then, finally, s of 5. S of 5 ends up being negative 5, 6, and then subtract from that S of 4, which is a negative 8 thirds. Again, you can verify this by pressing the buttons. And so in the end, what do we get? This is 11, 6. And then if I add these up, that ends up being a negative 9 halves. And then in magnitude, of course, plus the last one, if I add these up, I actually get 11, 6 again. And then if I add up 11, 6, positive 9 halves, after I take the absolute value, plus a positive 11, 6, this ends up giving me 49, 6. And remember that this is in meters. So that's the total distance that the particle travels in the first five seconds. A couple more questions here, and then we're done. How about the average velocity of the particle during the first five seconds? So remember, average velocity over this particular intervals from zero to five is the displacement, which is S of five minus S of zero. Notice that is not the same as what we were doing above, right? This is displacement here over the amount of time that has passed, so over five. And we saw above S of 5 was equal to negative 5 sixths. S of 0 is 0 all over 5. So what does that give us? It gives us negative 5 thirtieths. 
let me rewrite that 3 thirtieths, which is negative a 6. So negative 1 6 meter per second here is our units. Or if you want an approximation, approximately negative 0 0.167, let's say, meters per second. But I like, I like the nice fraction here better. So that's just change in position over change in time, the average rate of change of the position function over the intervals 0 to 5. And then finally, last part of this video, what is the average speed now of the particle during the first five seconds? So average speed, isn't this just going to be the total distance that the particle traveled over the total amount of time? Now, remember, we had already found right up here that the total distance that the particle traveled in the first five seconds was 49 sixth meters. So this in the numerator, 49 over six, total time, five seconds. I remember keeping in mind meters and seconds here. And if you simplify that, of course, that's 49 over 30 meters per second. And if you press a button, it ends up giving us the approximation 1.63 meters per second, approximately. And there you have it. So this was a nice little discussion here, dissecting all the different parts of just given a position function, what kinds of things can we figure out? And why is it that they are what they are? And so that concludes this video. Really, this is a video showing a particular type of application of using derivatives. And in the next couple of videos, show some other types of applications as well. Uh, maybe it has to do with other types of situations rather than position. So we'll see what that is in the next video or two. And until then, it is Mass and Beats, and I'm out of here.